Hello, everyone. Welcome to Book Talk, Uncle Race Nostalgia and the Politics of Loyalty with Dr. Cheryl Thompson. My name is Meredith Jordan, and I'm the Director of Alumni and Stakeholder Outreach at our university. We are really excited to gather here today to hear more about this very important thought-provoking book. Before we begin, I want to pay my respects to the Indigenous peoples, elders, and ancestors who stewarded and cared for the nature and people who lived on the land where our university is located today. At the university, we have made important commitments to reconciliation, and I invite you to learn more about this work online and in person the next time we can get together on campus. A couple of quick reminders. This session is being recorded, so you can re-watch it and share it with your network. And if you have a question for today's speakers, please type it in the Q&A feature on Zoom. We'll try our best to get to some of those near the end of the session. Now, I'm delighted to introduce you to the author of Uncle Race, Nostalgia, and the Politics of Loyalty, Dr. Cheryl Thompson, and the moderator for today's event, Dr. Anne-Marie Lee Loy. Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> Dr. Cheryl Thompson started as a TMU faculty member in creative industries back in 2018, and in 2022 joined performance as an assistant professor. She is currently associate professor and director of the Laboratory for Black Creativity. The lab's goal is to create space for Black creatives, scholars, artists, musicians, actors, directors, dancers, and choreographers at the Creative School. In 2021, Dr. Thompson was a recipient of an Ontario Early Researcher Award titled Mapping Ontario's Black Archives Through Storytelling and was named the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. She holds a PhD in Communication Studies from McGill University. She previously held a Banting Postdoc Fellowship, Canada's most prestigious postdoc award at the U of T Center for Theatre, Drama and Performance Studies and the U of T Mississauga's Department of English and Drama. And she graduated in 07 from TMU with a master's in communication and culture. In addition to publishing in academic journals, magazines and newspapers, she has also appeared on numerous podcasts and media platforms in Canada and internationally. Welcome, Dr. Cheryl. Yes, thank you so much. You're so welcome. And now we'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Anne-Marie Lee Loy, is the Associate Dean, Faculty of Arts at Toronto Metropolitan University. Dr. Anne-Marie's research explores questions pertaining to the construction and navigation of racialized identities in Caribbean contexts. A long time ago, her high school actually put on a production of Uncle Tom's Cabin, an experience that left her conflicted in many ways. So she was particularly intrigued to read your work, Cheryl, and to discuss it today. Welcome, Dr. Anne-Marie. Thank so you. With, you're welcome. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Dr. Anne-Marie to get us started. Thanks again, Meredith, and hi, Dr. Cheryl. We have a lot to talk about, but before <laughs> we begin, um, I'd like to just give a little bit of background on the book for your audience. So in Uncle, what Dr. Farrell is doing is she's diving into the evolution of the character of Uncle Tom. This was a character who originally appeared in an 1852 anti-slavery novel by Harriet Beecher Snow, so, um, entitled Uncle Tom's Cabin. So what Dr. Cheryl does is she explores how this figure was recreated and reimagined throughout the years in vaudeville and minstrel street, in advertising and radio, and TV, film, athletics, and politics. And she explores how Uncle Tom came to be and exposes this relentless reworking of the character of Uncle Tom, that figure, into a nostalgic racial metaphor with the power to shape how we see Black men. And this distortion is visible in a wide range of media from Uncle Ben on the Uncle Ben's rice box to Rastus, the cream of wheat chef, to Shirley Temple and Bill Bojangles Robinson, and even to Bill Cosby. Um, Dr. Cheryl also examines the work of subversive Black creatives and critics who have recontextualized and re-examined and challenged Uncle Tom's polarizing image over the years. So I do have some questions for Dr. Cheryl. Uh, we will have some time for audience questions at the end, so please don't forget to submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A function. So first question. Let's just start off by talking about how this book came to be. What made you decide that you wanted to write a book about Uncle Tom? 
Uh, yes, thank you so much. So the truth is, is that I'm one of those people, I'm like a creature of my environment. So it was around, I think it was around 2016, 2017. There was actually a lot of Uncle Tom, like, look backs at Uncle Tom around the city. There was an exhibit at a church um, in the city. There was the, um, the ward the mm-hmm. the publication the ward they had a dig an archaeological dig where they had found an uncle tom's cabin plate i subsequently talked about that plate in a book chapter the ward 2 and at city hall they actually had an exhibit with the plate so there was a lot of stuff in the ether and it just so happened that my editor at coach house books was like i just read uncle tom's cabin can we talk about it i think because there was so much uncle tom in the ether so we met we had coffee in the neighborhood we live in the same neighborhood and i just i kind of just did what i do i sort of just talked extemporaneously about my sense of the book why i think the book is still relevant how difficult it is to read the book and how the characters are still here and he was like sounds like you have a book. (laughs) And so in Hollywood terms, the rest is history, because that's literally where it started. It was a conversation that then led to uh, uh, writing a manuscript proposal, and then that led to the book. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go west to Dresden, Ontario, you can visit the Josiah Henson Museum. Now, Josiah Henson, as many of us know, was a real-life clergyman, a freedom fighter who escaped slavery. He made it to Canada on the Underground Railroad. Why do people think that Josiah Henry is the real Uncle Tom? Well, because he was. <laughs> you know, Josiah Henson, after the founding of um, the Dawn Settlement in Dresden um, in like the 1840s, by the time we get into the 1860s and 70s, you know, it's interesting because we we herald our um, historical African Canadians like Henson and many others, but we never put them into context. Mm -hmm. By the time you get into the 1860s and 70s, Josiah Henson is much older and he's not, he's poor. He doesn't have any money, right? He is literally suffering. And by then, because his story was connected to Harriet Beecher Stowe writing the novel in the first place, because Mm -hmm. many people don't know, they corresponded before the novel. And that's how the novel was actually initially short stories that she had written in the abolitionist newspaper, The National Era. She corresponded Mm -hmm. with him. So Uncle Tom really was loosely based on the real Josiah Henson's life. Flash forward to the 1880s, he's going on tour as the real Uncle Tom. He's basically using that celebrity gained from the novel to support himself. And again, in the 19th century, it was often before, and maybe this still continues to this day, it was very difficult for uh, readers and audiences to disconnect character from real person. Yeah. And so over time, the that him, him embroiling himself as a celebrity Uncle Tom just got merged with his own narrative, which really was different. But through that industry, he was made into an Uncle Tom and he used it to literally support himself and his family. Mm -hmm. And why did Uncle Tom, this character that that Beatrice Stowe created from these conversations, why did it have such a global scale at that time? Why did it resonate so widely? Right. So, I mean, she's writing um, sort of at the height of the abolitionist movement and the with the abolition movement, abolitionist movement, which really begins in Britain. Right. And then it migrates to the United States and then Canada. So Mm -hmm. you have the sort of the English world is caught up in the sentimentality and the the religiosity, because it was often religious institutions, the church, who were believing that obviously slavery was wrong. Black people should not be enslaved. We need to end slavery. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have an economic system rooted in Britain and America and Canada that is wedded to plantation slavery. Like, I think what one of the things that I wish I kind of delved a bit deeper into in the book, Mm -hmm. and which I do in my next book, which we talk about at the end, is really understand that the Western world was, was vested in the economies of plantation slavery, Mm -hmm. all the various economies, not just cotton plantation, but cotton uh, production, tobacco production, right? And so if you put it into context, this novel comes out and it's showing you the ills of slavery. 
It's showing you the brutality of the slave system. At the same time, it's showing you the danger of the literate enslaved person who becomes free. It's yeah. also showing you this dichotomy that there's the free black person and the enslaved black person. The enslaved black, per black person is an Uncle Tom. They they just love being on the plantation and they're so kind and they're never gonna they're never gonna do anything to harm you. Mm -hmm. the, the the person who frees themselves from this system of enslavement, they're dangerous, they're literate, they're angry, they're aggressive, they're trying to assert themselves as an individual. They are actually trying to live out the promise of the Western world, which mm -hmm. is of autonomy and individualism. They are actually trying to inhabit that, but they become a danger because they basically have said no to this economic and social system that the entire Western world is, is wedded to. So that's why from that book, that book is actually said to be credited to have launched the Civil War because of those narratives of the free enslaved in the North and the enslaved in the South. And what that what that actually meant, not just to the Union, the American Union, but to the Western, the English speaking Western world in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, it's, it's just it's really interesting to think of it on that global scale that you've really, really articulated so well, which brings us to the next question, which takes us away from the origins of Uncle Tom to think about how that language and imagery still exists today. So we know that people are very complex, yeah. yet it seems that Black people, once they're in the spotlight, and when I mean spotlight, I mean media, celebrities, politicians, athletes, they're often labeled, when we start throwing labels around, they become either Uncle Tom, a sellout, or they are framed as a militant. And we saw that, for example, with Muhammad Ali, right? Yes. There's nothing between the two poles. So the question then is, why do you think that is? And along that vein, why do you think the Uncle Tom stereotype, this racial trope has lasted so long? And I think you've given us some suggestions mm -hmm. in your, your, your talk about the history of the character appearing. But why do you think that Uncle Tom stereotype has lasted so long? And why do you think we are so vested in having the trope of the militant and the Uncle Tom? Yeah, because, you know, Blackness in the Western world, as it's been articulated since the moment of our arrival around the 15th century, has always been vested in this idea of us being two people. That there's the one type and the other type, mm -hmm. and not a lot of nuance in between. And then if we flash forward in time and we think of the 19th century literary industry, starting with Uncle Tom's Cabin, it just perpetuated that. As we get into the 20th century, the truth is Hollywood movies, they did not create it. They just, they created the foundation, but they actually didn't create, they're not the root, they're just mm -hmm. the foundation, right? Meaning the roots is under the ground <laughs> that you really can't see. The foundation is laid down by concrete and we think that's, that. we think that's as far as it goes. It doesn't, but because it's foundational, all the imagery that we have all seen the last century, really, right? Because it's really in the 20s that the Hollywood machine ramps up. Mm -hmm. It just, it just perpetuated it to the extent that we, and I, I, I've thought about this before we started this talk. It is no different than the victim and the hero. Those mythologies of the victim and the hero that 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 run through literature, they also run through film. So we know we're watching a film. We're not, okay. I always think of it. Anybody who watches CSI, you should know what I'm talking about. It usually starts with a woman who's a victim. Yeah. And then now there's like a multi-gender team and racial team that's trying to solve it. When I was a child, it was white men who then mm -hmm. went on the next hour of the show to find out who killed the white woman. That right. was literally my childhood. And if we, if everyone here thinks about that trope, it should become very simple to think why then you still have the duality of the Uncle Tom and the militant. It works in the exact same way as the hero and the victim works. Mm -hmm. So you're basically saying that Hollywood has no place for nuance. <laughs> That's a really no. hard time managing nuance. No, and it's not even that they, the truth is, it's not that Hollywood has no space for nuance, is that Hollywood is risk adverse, mm. okay? yes. like yes. most creative yes. industries are. So if it works, why reinvent the wheel? Mm. If audiences are responding to the narratives of the militant and the Uncle Tom, well, then that's what we're going to give them. Mm. If we try to give them anything else, 
think about films over the last 50 years that tried to do something else and they failed. Like they were unsuccessful at the box office or critics lamented the film itself. And so what happens? They then shy back and say, well, we're not going to do that again. You know what? Let's give them another Uncle Tom. We know that that's going to work. Yeah, And I think that what comes out in your book, which I'm not going to, it's just a little teaser for people, is that you really do talk a lot about how Blackness is produced in these economies, in these capitalist systems. Um, and that's just something that people who want to read the book could delve into. I think they discover really interesting um, exploration that you do uh, on that topic. But I wanted to ask you about Uncle Tom a little bit more as a literary figure. I know that we are running short on time, but this is, I think, a curious question because you know that when Uncle Tom first appears in literature, he's actually quite a radical figure. He's a radical imagining of black manhood in the time of slavery. And yet he's so easily co-opted into a minstrel tradition, um, which could, <laughs> could be nothing farther than radical black manhood. Might this co-option tell us something about the politics of the radical? Yeah, I mean, the politics of the radical can always be centered. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just that that's that's the difficulty with any radical movement. Over time, it becomes a mainstream movement. Mm. So, or what happens is, I should be clear, is an aesthetic quality or a rhetorical quality of the movement gets taken and that's what gets mainstreamed. That's why now you see all these right wing Republicans talking about woke culture. It's like, okay, you took that word, but you took mm -hmm. out all the actual meaning and purpose and collectivizing that created that word in the first place. They just take the word. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in the mainstream, how they literally, um, eradicate the movement or end the radicalness is that they cling to the thing that is actually the most reproducible. And that's kind of at the center of my book. I think the central argument is that I'm making is that while race, yes, they say race is socially conduct, um, constructed, race is an identity. What I'm arguing is that no, 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 race is a commodity that gets produced and reproduced depending on the time and the industry that people are interested in, in putting it and selling it into. So that's the reason the radical, it's really tough in the Western world because we are wedded to a capitalist system that looks to sell products. Mm -hmm. and, and, in order to, and in order to sell a product, you need a message. And I think that that would be a really, really exciting thing to read about in the book. I mean, we don't have time to discuss it, this, the idea of selling and reproducing and commodifying blackness. If you want to explore that, certainly pick up the book and delve into that a little deeper. Before we end and turn over the questions to the audience, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about what you're doing next. You've already written a couple of books. Um, Uncle, there's another one entitled Beauty in a Box. Uh, so is there any other work in the near future for you? I may have heard something about a documentary in the works. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. There is a documentary in the works. There's going to be a trailer that's going to drop very soon. Uh, wait for it, everyone. Edge of your seat. And the next thing that <laughs> I'm like adding in these like emotive <laughs> responses, um, the next thing that's coming is that I did write a third book. It's called Canada and the Blackface Atlantic, Plantation wow. Slavery in the Age of Theatrical Reproductions. And it's essentially using blackface as a theatrical form to explain kind of taking, to be honest, I always look at that, the book that I've written, <clears throat> I realize that what it does is like I've taken that deep, thick, um, archival research that went into Beauty in the Box mm -hmm. and sort of the the uh, the the light playful storytelling and sort of the the narrative storytelling of Uncle and I've just brought them together to tell this really complicated story of what is blackface where does it come from and not just that how is it also linked to economic systems and to a literal centuries long obsession with plantation slavery. Hmm. One of the arguments that that book makes is that while we think the Hollywood film is what created the slave genre of movies, like I always say, you have to go back to the 19th century for everything. And it's the 19th century that creates an audience appetite to see reproductions of plantation slavery, both pre-emancipation and post. That's essentially the, the major argument of the book. 
Mm, and you're also linking it to Canada, which I think is very interesting because we think of the minstrel tradition as being something that's uniquely placed in the American South. Maybe, maybe it might have trickled up north, but you know, it gets stopped at the border. We don't think of it as actually crossing over into these artificial boundaries of borders between Canada and the U.S., right? That yeah. there would be, there would be a, a, a place to sell that to take that language of your reproduction and sellability that there is a place in Canada there's a market uh, to consume that as well I mean I can just briefly give you a perfect example the first minstrel character not not production but character was called Jim Crow the same name that was then instituted for um, legislative segregation mm-hmm. created in 1831-32 By 1836, Jim Crow travels to Britain, and guess what? Jim Crow heads north to Canada the same year. So that tells you, and hence the name of the book, I'm really speaking of an Atlantic culture that's wedded to sort of these productions of slavery and the enslavement of Black people. And so that book, let's just say, wait for it, (laughs) it's coming. Yeah, 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 and I think that 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 because you just said Atlantic, and I, I'm going a little off script, but you know that whole idea of the Black Atlantic, uh, you know, expanding what's being exchanged in terms of Black. That's, you that's know, right. We often talk about Black culture being exchanged, but there is a reproductibility of Blackness that's being exchanged external to Black communities as well. That's really important, I think. That's right. Now. As a successful scholar, writer, and professor, what advice would you provide to current TMU students or grads or recent grads and aspiring writers that are listening today? It's very simple. Write. (laughs) You have to do the thing to become the thing. And you can't not do it because you're worried of rejection. Do you know how much rejection I get? (laughs) That's beyond just writing, just in general in life. (laughs) If I have a... 40 plus years of rejection, right? (laughs) To to work through. And it's actually helped me because in the rejection is where you actually grow and learn as a scholar, as a writer, as a person who wants to use words to communicate a message. For me, I actually, yes, we have these titles, writer and author and all that, but I actually just see myself as a communicator and I've chosen words as my medium, right? Other people choose movement, dance. Other people choose movement through acting and and, and, and imagination. I choose the non-literary, sorry, the non-fiction literary arena to just express. So I say, write and don't be afraid of rejection and please be open to edits, (laughs) right? And be open to people critiquing your work. And most of all, if you believe that you are going to be a writer or that you can become a writer, then you have to cling to that belief even when people are telling you that they're not going to publish this for various reasons. It took me many years before I started to get published. And once I did, it's like a, you know, a, a, a trickle down effect. It just kept happening. And, but I still get rejected. I got rejected from something just last week. Mm-hmm. And, but now when I get rejected, I laugh and I think big mistake because you're going to see this thing. I'm not going to let go, right? It's going to be published somewhere. And then you're going to see it and you're going to realize that you said no. So now I kind of have that pretty woman kind of attitude about it. Like, it's fine. Like you can reject me, but I'm not going to give up, but you have to do it. And I think too many of our young students, writers, scholars are just kind of encouraged to give up on themselves too early in the, in the, in the journey. Right. Right. Well, we do have some audience questions, so I'd like to turn to them now. The first one is, what is one message you hope readers take away with them from reading the book? Um, You know, I think it's the way I end the book. The very last line in Uncle says that Uncle Tom is our collective whisper. (laughs) That's the very last line. And what that means is, is that pay attention. You know, one of the issues of not just our time, of the history of time, is a lack of consciousness, right? People think that the outside world has to fill you when, no, 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 you have to fill yourself 
with awareness and deep insight to see patterns that are forming around you and mm -hmm. ask yourself, ooh, is this about me or is this about something else? So I actually think when people read this book, they will realize that there has been a blackness that has been created that is outside of you and your lived reality. So you have to be able to make a distinction between, oh, that's a that's a caricature and this is the real person. And like you said in the intro, Bill Cosby is the perfect example of that. We thought Dr. Cosby was real. Dr. Cosby was a character. The real Cosby was completely different. Mm -hmm. And I think if you take anything, it's to understand that that duality of this is fiction and this is reality. Yeah. Yes. And Dr. Uh, Bill Cosby really messed up things for Dr. Huxtable. <laughs> we, have, we have another question. Can you explain how someone like Sidney Poitier was considered to be an Uncle Tom, even though he was making strides in Hollywood and also working to advance civil rights? Yes, and I think I handle um, Sidney Poitier with some care in my book. I'm not, I'm not actually really critical of him. I'm more thinking about, again, the roles. It's not about him, it's about the roles. And you have to understand the roles that Sidney Poitier played at the time that he played them was the same time cities in America were on fire and black people were fighting for rights, right? Mm -hmm. Go back and look at 1968 and then watch Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. You almost can't even watch that movie because you know what's really happening on the streets. So it's not Cindy Portier as an actor. And even at the time, that's what the critique was about him. It wasn't about him because you're right. He was doing many firsts and he was representing what seemed to be such a dignified Black representation, right? Well-dressed, mm -hmm. well-spoken, but at the same time, turn on the evening news in 1968 and that's not the reality. The reality was quite starkly different. And so that's the reason he was so criticized. But, you know, he made up for it in the 70s. <laughs> I think he, it's true. If you watch Sidney Poitier's movies in the 70s, he really did make up for it. And, and I think he had a little bit of reflection, like, you know, a Black actor, the, the success of a Black actor can't just be about the roles that we play. It has to be about changing the perception of what it means to be Black. Mm. Yeah. This is, I think, our last question, because we only have three minutes. But um, what was the hardest part of writing this book? And what was the most rewarding? Mm, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part of writing the book was actually making sense of it all. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm a person who dares to write ac across many forms and across time. And when you endeavor to do that, it's really difficult because you want to make sure you're being true to not just the time periods, right? But mm -hmm. also the, um, the forms that you're in, in, engaging in. So for example, the first two chapters in Uncle are, are, is really a literary discussion. Mm -hmm. And then it pivots to the stage. And then it pivots <clears throat> then it pivots sort of to the culture. And then it pivots to film. So that was really hard. And but I but I realized from that experience that I'm kind of good at it. So that's maybe my my niche. Um, so what was the hardest thing? And then what was the most memorable? Was that the second part of that question? Mm. Yeah. Well, what um, was rewarding? What was the most rewarding? Oh, the most rewarding. I would say, you know, there's nothing more rewarding than when you actually physically have the book in your hand. <laughs> You know, like because people don't realize how many people have, have, have the labor of so many people goes into producing a book. You are author, you wrote the words, but there are so many hands that it goes through and so many decision makers and so many people who who give you insight on on where they think. I mean, believe me, Uncle was highly edited. Some of the edits I really like. Some of the edits I was like, mm. but you know, it's part of the process. As a writer, you you sometimes you have to let go and uh, see where your the editorial team they have a vision for the work as well. Um, but when you see it in your hand and it's real, you think to yourself, "Wow, like what a ride!" And then you also start to think well, this is now a legacy. Like anytime, like someone can go on Amazon or go on something, they could put my name in the, in the search bar. And it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna find something. Yeah, It's like that in itself is kind of an amazing thing, especially when you're a person as I was, who was, this is a true story. When I was in grade high school mm -hmm. in Scarborough, 
shout out to my Scarborough people. I was in an English class and it was a substitute English teacher. So mm -hmm. she wasn't the permanent teacher, but she was there for a very long time. I submitted an essay, got the essay back, and the teacher wrote on the essay, this is a really good essay. Did you write this? Oh. Wow. Since I'm only here for a short time, I'm just going to assume that you did. I swear to you, I have never forgotten that feedback in my entire life. So what she really said to me, even though she recognized the talent, because the talent was in this form, she just couldn't believe that it was my words. I mm -hmm. obviously had to have cheated or got it, got it from somewhere else. And I cling to that. And I always think to myself, that's every time I publish a book and I hold it, I actually remember that. Oh. And I think, I wonder if she's asking that question now when she goes and says my name. <laughs> across the book if that's if that's not the same student that I that I questioned in 94 um so that's I would say yeah when you when you have the thing in your hand it's it's magic mm -hmm. yeah. and then what a plug for the tangible book as well <laughs> yes. 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 out there in space so yeah. thank you so much for um having this discussion with me and um for writing the book and I'll pass it back over to Meredith now Thank you, Dr. Anne-Marie, and thank you, Cheryl, for, for overcoming that, that bit of feedback and using it to bolster what, what is an incredible uh, career and, and body of work. Um, thank you both, uh, Dr. Cheryl and Dr. Anne-Marie, for, for this great discussion, and thank you to our audience for being here with us today. Look out for an email from us with a link to the recording of this book so you can rewatch it and share it with your friends, as well as more information on where you can purchase UNCLE if you've not already read it. Until next time, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here and take care.